This is Twit. Um, I both of you have written about it. Uh, Stephen, we'll start with your story: the ugly lessons <laughs> of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. Uh, one of the stories that came out, I think, today is that uh, there have been uh, intimations that they were taking too much risk for years, that they've even been under investigation uh, for some time now. Um, what do we learn? What have we learned from this? And and is this going to be a problem going forward? Credit Suisse now is, is uh, kind of right. shaking. Right. Well, we, we learned a few things, and none of them, you know, as uh, my headline flex, are pretty one one thing that was, struck me was how the bank really operated as a sort of a cheerleader for the whole um ecosystem of founders and funding and you know uh they threw parties um they had uh, a lot of uh clients in the wine industry so you know uh they would sort of cross-pollinate, you know, those with the tech people and share the great vintage wines with them and <laughs> you go into their offices. They, you know, some of the executives of the bank would have wine fridges. And, you know, uh, and I, I mentioned saying, is this sort of behavior um, really what you want from your fiduciaries, right? The, you know, I when I think of a bank I want to trust, I think of like the the guy who hired Mary Poppins, right? You know, the- A you know, banker, in, yeah. A banker, with a yes. bowler and, so, and a furled, tightly furled umbrella, yeah, yeah. And he, and he says, "I know where everything is." And at six twenty, I'm going to come home and then <laughs> you know, going to be greeted and you know, kind of, and and that's that's sort of the boring kind of person you want in charge of your finances. So the other, so these people who like say they they embrace risk all the time. As it turns out, they weren't cognizant of this kind of risk. Um, it was on it was avoidable. Any idiot knows what the limit is in what you're insured about. And then when it happens, they sort of do a 180 from their normal point of view of saying, you know, government stay out of it and saying, hey, the government should like now forget about this limit and, you know, uh, go from $250,000 to reimbursement to infinity because, you know, otherwise our payrolls can be lost. Well, this is an industry that's laid off over a hundred thousand people. Right. And you know, the fate of those people is sort of shrugged off. And now all of a sudden, you know, meeting a payroll and having people not paid for a day or two is, you know, going to collapse the economy. So it, it, it's by sort of the, um, you know, insularity and you know hypocrisy i guess of uh the valley and and you know can their rush to you know really create a bank run um uh from the this place where they loyally uh supported for a number of years you know uh show that this you know one for all all for one uh community you know really you know uh fell apart when the bullets started flying yeah uh, but you would agree that the Fed uh, and the FDIC did the right thing to backstop all those deposits, or no? Well, um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I think that you know maybe there was a way to do that where they could have, uh, you know, uh, maybe had a much higher limit, or, or said, you know, uh, at a certain point, you know, you're, that all your deposits aren't guaranteed for this day but in the meantime by then things had gotten to the point where you know uh they were saying well the whole economy is at risk of people uh deposits aren't going to be protected and the fact is you talk about hallucinations in gpt4 you know the whole monetary system is kind of a hallucination that you know everyone sort of accepts the fact that if nothing happens and people don't pull out their money right away banks are okay but uh the fact is that you know if things could turn on a dime and uh, we could be facing giant problems in the economy uh, because we all of a sudden we abandon our shared agreement not to pull out money from the bank. Right. Alex, your article uh, talks about, and you mentioned this earlier, the over financialization of tech and, and yes. the SVB bank. What do you mean? What's, what's that all about? Well, look, one of the things that I saw that I that really sort of made my antennas go up was that there was, you know, the public largely supported the bailout, but there was a loud enough and big enough chunk of the public who were willing to let 
the bank fail that it was worth examining who they were and why and what has happened to tech that it began as this underdog industry, one that, you know, was there fighting the establishment, one that you could root for, that was fun, um, that everyone would support, basically, unless you were like the establishment would support, you know, keeping keeping vibrant and keeping healthy. And why would anyone then say that, okay, well, we should have uh, have these companies fail. They're just, you know, rich uh, bastards anyway. But that's what's happened. But look at Elon Musk as a perfect example. Right. The trans transition from, you know, uh, the, the uh, Stark Industries genius transforming by yes. being a rebel, by being one of the crazy ones, the people who think different, changing the world, making the world a better place, to just another batshit crazy billionaire. Right. Uh, so, look, I think that it goes beyond Elon, though. And this is the point that I was making in the story, and we talked about it on the show also, is that tech has been, like most much of the economy, over-financialized, right? Which is that it has in some, not everyone, of course, but some companies have just tried to squeeze every ounce of money onto the balance sheet no matter, not really paying attention to the cost. One example, which we know is that DoorDash, right, would take tips that it would get for Dashers and then <laughs> Keep count that towards its minimum payment to the Dashers. <laughs> they would never see the tip. And I have to say that, like, when you do to this type, when you do that stuff, there is a downstream risk. People are going to see it eventually. And I think you started to see it when, you know, everybody, you know, in the, in the U.S. at least, knows an Amazon worker, knows a Dasher, knows an Uber driver, right? And when those when that, when that squeezing happens, there's a political cost to it, which you end up having people who are saying, okay, like, let the bastards fail. And, you know, they're not, they don't care, like, necessarily, and this was the text, text argument, right? Your money's not going to go to DoorDashers. But what they're saying is, well, the whole DoorDash system is corrupt. Now, DoorDash, of course, has fixed that, right? after some some press attention because they got fighting. caught yeah but it ex exactly it exists all over right and i think that you know for those of us who root for tech i root for tech to be a strong industry but what what you know people want from tech is that um it provides all this benefit it can provide through computing through technology in a way that isn't needlessly extractive and the fact that some cordons of the industry have become needlessly extractive has cost so much political will that there was a very vocal group of folks who said let it fail and in fact when it was coming into the white house right with discussions of like when this thing should be bailed out it took the whole weekend before biden eventually gave in he and was aware me, i'm I sure think, of the political backlash yeah. of of quote, course bailing out billionaire bailout yeah that was what he was worried about and it doesn't have to be that way because at its best tech is for the little person and I, that's all the whole thing and i talked to my story a little bit about new york tech meetup i don't know if either of you have been there but it was this amazing meetup it still goes on to some extent but at its height in the early 2010s we would have local startups come in and just kind of show off what they built and it was right after the financial crisis so you started to have some people from wall street seep in to try to get second careers inside tech and whenever you you uh, spoke about your finances, your VC fundings, uh, the whole place would boo and people would <laughs> shout, get to the demo, right? And that's sort of what I think, the, going back to that spirit of I get to that. the demo, show us the tech. Like, I think that's what we need to get back to in some ways. To some you degree, know, for, this is for, what for, happens for, for, in all industries, right? I mean, the, the yeah. in the early days of of oil, the wildcatters and the, the crazy guys digging oil wells and having gushers. And eventually it's successful. It monetizes. It's a bunch of fat cats with monocles and cigars. That's what happens with any successful uh, industry, right? Stephen, I'm yeah, sorry. For, for, you know, for many years, the overwhelming narrative of tech was David versus Goliath. And then at a certain point in the past few years, it's, it's changed. Yeah, it's changed to it's changed to the Icarus myth. Ah, to too close yeah. to the sun. Yeah. It's, it's wings are melting um yeah i mean alex you you make your living uh kind of uh talking about big technology and yes. and the threat in in some ways that the big technology can pose to uh, all of the rest of us what's the uh, solution i mean it's a simple solution right to look tech is big business now no denying that right because it's but successful also, exactly it's successful and i do think that 
Look, I think once you saw the first IPOs, you saw the first public companies, you saw the first trillion dollar company, that became so alluring, right? The uh, For CEOs, it became, the mark was not what your company can do, but the mark was how, what was your net worth? What was your market cap? How much had you raised? These had all became the successful parts of uh, the successful markers in the tech industry. And obviously that's what shifted the, the industry's perception among other people. And so I think it's very simple. I think it's step back, focus again on the customer, focus again on tech. And again, get to the demo. I mean, let's see this. And that's sort of <laughs> what's see the tech. And it's interesting because yeah. we're having we're having this amazing moment right now where we're seeing so many cool things happen with AI. And in some ways, tech is getting back to the demo in that area, right? We're going from zero to one, not one to, you know, N or whatever it is. And, uh, and that's exciting to me. But I do think that, you know, we... I think that it's just something that the tech industry needs to keep in, in mind and maybe it needs new spokespeople, right? I mean, that's another thing that we're hearing about now. Tech has been represented by some very loud, obnoxious people. Um, people like Mark Andreessen, who I don't think really puts the best uh, image for, you know, on, on the tech industry. And it, I would actually say his entire firm. And I think like right now, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, who've been silent in the tech industry are starting to speak up and kind of talk about what the industries what the sector's values are and i think that's a good thing so is it Stephen? though a little bit just nostalgia i mean you and i both remember the homebrew computer club you were you know covered the early days of the mit hackers they were a rough and ready you know anti-social band of uh, misfits um at, you know as was i guess apple in the early days um those days aren't coming back not in the same way um you know, uh, but, you know, there is a thriving startup culture um, that where people do a reset. Now, a startup in, you know, the 2020s uh, isn't the same as a startup in the late 1970s or early 80s. Um, you know, uh, there's a pathway and, you know, like a lot of the founders have their eyes on the prize from the get go. Right. They're, you know, they're, um, you know, Y Combinator when it started in 2005 gave $5,000 plus $5,000 for each founder to the company as his stake investment. The investment now for each company in Y Combinator is $500,000. Yeah. Right. And, you know, so, you know, um, they're on a fair path to fail big or get big. Um, so that, that is different yet, you know, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of, you know, contending 20 years from now, the companies that are, we're going to be talking about our companies that are starting now or maybe haven't even started yet. Also, one thing that I think is is worth pointing out is that, yeah, of course, we're not going to go back to those days, but we now know that it's a political risk, right, to uh, to be where we are today, right? It almost sent the whole industry into a tailspin because of the image, the billionaire bailout. Yeah. And, and that is the issue, right? And so once that political risk is realized, and I really think it is, like, I think this has been a wake up call to many in Silicon Valley about what could happen to them, you know, based off of public sentiment. I think that might lead to change. Words, we're not going to go back to hobbyists and we're not going to probably probably won't have less funding, uh, but we will we will definitely go back to a, you know, maybe go back to a time where we didn't have this over financialization of the economy, at least that's of, of the sector. And at least that's my hope. Should we yeah, break up least, th these big tech companies like we did Standard Oil or Ma Bell? They'll probably do a good enough job on their own of, of breaking themselves um, up. <laughs> being, no, either break, breaking themselves up or or being out competed. I mean, look at what's happened to Meta just this year, right? Just in the yeah. past year, look at what happened to Meta, right? This challenge from TikTok. Look at what happened to Google. This challenge from OpenAI and Microsoft. So I really believe that competition will do the better job in terms of humbling these companies than the government coming in and saying you can have Amazon retail, but you can't have Amazon Web Services. You know, and Leo, you know, from, you know, uh, being, you know, like around so much that, you know, we go into waves of success mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and cold periods and busts and booms. But one thing that does not vary is, you know, the arrow of the technology itself. It just keeps getting better. Innovations keep coming. There's never like a downtime for the technology improving. 
And you know, can, we're seeing that now in, in AI, it, it's apparent to us, but there's always going to be something coming along to build on the previous advances. It, it, you know, so, and the innovation of tomorrow is going to go faster because we've had all the previous innovations. So we're arguing about the state of whether it's big companies, small companies, um, uh, you know, do we need different people? But one constant is that technology keeps getting better and better. And uh, that's what is exciting. And that's what's thrilling. And that's what's scary about our world. Yeah, I agree. It's the thing that makes it most interesting to, to cover, to, to look at and to, and, to, and to speculate about. And, you know, I have to say that it's not been good for a huge amount of money to flow into tech because that attracts the greedy. It also attracts the scammers. And you see, you know, NFTs mm -hmm. and Bitcoin and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, scams. Look, Andreessen Horowitz, Mark Andreessen pushing Web3, which is a blatant, you know, grab for uh, the, the free and open Internet. Uh, you know, I see companies like Spotify and Amazon going after our little uh, corner of the world, RSS-based podcasting. But I agree with you, Stephen. I think in the long run, the human spirit, there's always going to be some little person who has a great idea who uh, is going to change the world. Uh, it may not be Elizabeth Holmes, but uh, there's always going to be somebody like that, I think. Yeah. Maybe that person got laid off by a big company this yeah, year. Yeah, even better, right? And is forced to go back to the garage and find something better. Hey, I know you're super busy, so I won't keep you long, but I wanted to tell you about a show here on the Twit Network called Tech News Weekly. You are a busy person, and uh, during your week, you may want to learn about all the tech news that's fit to, well, say, not print, here on Twit. It's Tech News Weekly. Uh, me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell. We talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news, and we love the opportunity to get to share those stories with you and let the people who wrote them or broke them share them as well. So I hope you check it out every Thursday right here on Twit. 